sleek, sinister, and lethal. This plane is built for speed. The Messerschmitt BF-109 haunted Allied skies during World War II. The BF-109 was on the minds of all Allied pilots. The sight of a formation of BF-109 just put a pit in their stomach. It was Nazi Germany's go-to fighter and a favorite among its pilots. This was an aerodynamically perfect aircraft. In less than a decade, the 109 racked up more aerial victories than any other aircraft. They are the leading aces, not only in World War II, but in the history of aerial combat. This is the story of the rise and fall of the Nazis' premier aircraft and how a symbol of an evil empire changed aerial combat for decades to come. October 19th, 1943, four years into World War II. The German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, inflicts a devastating toll on Allied aircraft over Germany. In less than one week, more than 140 American bombers are lost. The price of air war is high. 600 American boys lost or prisoners of war in this one air attack. Bombers are worth $20 million gone. It's clear that air superiority over the Reich still rests firmly in German hands. At the center of their defense is Nazi Germany's prized fighter, the Messerschmitt BF-109. The BF-109, the Luftwaffe's go-to fighter in the skies over Europe. Behind me is a Messerschmitt BF-109, credited with thousands of aerial victories against Allied pilots during World War II. At 29 feet long and only 32 feet wide, this compact fighter is built for speed. It was an incredibly modern all-metal monoplane fighter. This low wing gave it impressive performance, and this streamlined and uncluttered fuselage meant that it had very little aerodynamic drag. Powered by a Daimler-Benz 605 engine, the 109 can push speeds up to 425 miles per hour. It was every fighter pilot's dream to fly one in the Luftwaffe, and as soon as they got in one, that boost of confidence that came from the exceptional maneuvering characteristics of this airplane made it a deadly adversary. Throughout the fall of 1943, the 109s continued to rack up aerial victories over Germany. And bestows hundreds of its pilots with the title of ace. This was an aerodynamically perfect aircraft as every Messerschmitt aircraft was, but this specifically, this absolutely unbelievable aircraft Lieutenant Jörg Cipiaka was a BF-109 fighter pilot during World War II. The aircraft was fast and good in extreme high height. I actually called this flying in this aircraft as extension of the right hand because the aircraft was to any movement was so responsive. It made the aircraft part of you. You were in contact with the aircraft all the time. And this is a, an advantage. I love this thing. If American bombers are going to make it over German lines, it's clear they'll have to go through the Luftwaffe first. Determined to protect their bombers from further attack, U.S. Air Forces outfit their escorts with one of their newest aircraft, the P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter they pray will finally give the deadly Messerschmitts a run for their money. May 27th, 1944. Hundreds of Allied bombers filled the sky, all headed for Ludwigshafen, Germany, home to a critical Nazi fuel refinery. 
oil and gas. <laughs> That's the lifeblood of the German military. Clarence Bud Anderson was an American P-51 fighter pilot and triple ace in World War II. It was a synthetic fuel plant the bombers were going after, pretty deep in Germany. Anderson and his group of P-51 Mustang fighters are there to escort the massive bomber group. If the German 109 strike, it will be up to Anderson to fend them off. We were just about to the target area, just about getting into Germany when my wingman calls out, we got bogeys coming after us from five o'clock high. Anderson looks up and spots an incoming swarm of German fighters. We're here, they're coming right here. Makes us very vulnerable. I could recognize them right away. They were Emmy 109 G's, their best high altitude fighter. All right, men on the ball, this is it. 109's at nine o'clock. Anderson and his P-51s jump into action. Red flight, stay up for cover. Yellow flight, continue to escort. Anderson pulls into a sharp turn, desperate to draw the 109s away from the bombers. And I look back, and I go, oh my God, he's coming after us. The 109s match his turn and lock on to his squadron of P-51s. I knew I was up against some experienced pilots. We were pretty even. And we're at four of us on one side and four on the other side of the circle going around. Hoping to close the gap, Anderson pushes to full throttle. And so after about two turns, we slowly started to creep up on him. He lines up his gun sight and fires. Black smoke comes out. Pieces start coming off. That's one gone. But the Messerschmitts are just getting started. In no time, another 109 is on his tail. Anderson tries to shake him, but the 109 holds on tight. All of his moves were aggressive. I knew I was fighting somebody that had full in combat, because <laughs> he knew what to do. Out of options, Anderson pulls back hard on his stick, and the two fighters rocket up. As they climb, the 109 slowly inches its nose higher into firing position. I can close my eyes right now and I can see the nose of that Emmy 109 and that big hole through the propeller with a cannon sticks out through it. The Messerschmitt 109G was one of the most heavily armed variants of the 109. Our G model Messerschmitt 109 would have featured two 7.9 millimeter machine guns here in this housing above the engine. These weapons were synchronized to fire through the propeller arc. It also had the potent sting of a 20 millimeter cannon also mounted above the engine, firing straight through the center of the propeller's hub. In addition to the cowling machine guns and 20 millimeter propeller cannon, the 109G could be fitted with either two additional 20 millimeter cannons under each wing or 21 centimeter mortar rockets. Under the fuselage, there's room for a 550 pound bomb or four 110 pound bombs. Capable of firing its cannons at a rate of 750 rounds per minute, the 109s have more than enough firepower to shoot a P-51 clean out of the sky. Nearly six miles up, Captain Anderson is locked in a vertical climb with a 109. Looking back there, seeing an enemy airplane on your tail is not a good feeling pushing their aircraft to the limit. 
Both fighters are on the verge of stalling. We're both going like this, and somebody's going to lose their airspeed and stall out. And the first guy that does that is going to be in trouble. If Anderson can't get out of the line of fire soon, he'll be nothing more than target practice for the deadly message. High above the German border, Captain Bud Anderson and a Messerschmitt 109 push upwards in a steep vertical climb. Both aircraft on the edge of stalling. I'm praying that he's going to stall pretty soon and have to fall off, and then I can drop on his tail again. So I'm watching him, and sure enough, I see him start to wobble around. Just in time, the 109 sputters and begins to fall. Boy, it was just a great relief, and I, whew, I could follow him down soon, right there again. Anderson dives in pursuit, now hot on the tail of the 109. So I thought, oh, by God, I'm going to try to get inside of him this time. So I, I cut inside of him. I said, hot dog, I'm, I'm going to make it. I could tell I was going to get inside of him. He locks his gun sight onto the 109 and puts his finger on the trigger. I glanced at my ball and got it in the middle. Fire burst. And I got spectacular results. I got it all over the engine, the cockpit. That just lights up like a Christmas tree. The 109 spirals downwards billowing smoke as it falls. And I can see his shadow on the ground. And pretty soon, wow, bang, he and his shadow met a tremendous explosion. Anderson clears out, breathing a sigh of relief. He was probably the best, best pilot I ran into in the, the whole war in Europe. It's no small feat to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Messerschmitt 109 and live to tell the tale. Built in secret less than a decade earlier, the 109 quickly becomes an essential tool of Nazi Germany's evil regime. January 1933, Berlin, Germany. After years of instability, Adolf Hitler is appointed as German Chancellor vowing to restore the country to its former greatness. One of Hitler's first activities upon coming to power in January of 1933 was to begin to rearm the country. Hitler's aviation ministry gets to work building up a brand new air force. One of their first requests, a state-of-the-art fighter plane. They were looking for a swift aircraft, an aircraft that whose punch would really be provided by speed. Because the first thing you have to achieve on a battlefield under modern conditions is air superiority. Four companies submit bids for the new fighter. Arado, Heinkel, Bakovulf, and BFW. But one proposal stands head and shoulders above the rest. BFW's BF-109. Designed by Chief Engineer Willie Messerschmitt. Willie Messerschmitt tried to build the smallest airframe around the most powerful engine available at the time. It had very short wings, but it was very fast. And, and the key to the BF-109 is its speed. Messerschmitt's 109 design is built to cut through the air like a knife. Equipped with retractable landing gear, a streamlined metal frame, and a fully enclosed cockpit, the 109 is a born dogfighter. And the key to its performance are its wings. A modern feature not found on American aircraft until significantly later were the automatically deploying leading edge slats. These slats would automatically extend when the aerodynamic forces over the wing dictated, 
allowing the airplane to make much tighter turns and to change the lifting performance of the wing to better enable the maneuverability that fighter pilots so crave in a dogfight. March 1936. The German Air Ministry puts in its first order of Messerschmitt Bf 109s. And only nine months later, Hitler finds the perfect testing ground for his brand new weapon, Spain. December 1936. Civil war has been raging across Spain for nearly five months. Hitler puts his weight behind rebel leader General Francisco Franco. Stalin and his Soviet Union back the sitting prime minister, Manuel Azaña. Spain was this ideal testing ground for Germany in the development of its armed forces, and in particular with the Luftwaffe. They would send new weapons, try new tactics, and basically Spain became this very bloody experiment. Out front are Germany's new 109 prototypes. And it's not long before the fighter shows the world just what it's made of. The world was looking at, you know, arguably the best fighter in the sky. And it showed, first of all, German design capabilities, but it also showed Germany's determination to be armed to the teeth for war. Over Spain, 109 pilots experiment with brand new tactics, gaining the edge over the Russian aircraft. The most important tactical development in the Spanish Civil War was developed by Werner Mulders, and that was the Finger Four formation. Around the world, all the air forces were using the VIC, and that's basically a three-plane formation in the shape of a triangle. But the problem with the VIC is that only the leader of that flight can scan the skies for danger. Instead of the VIC, German pilots space out their 109 formations and add an additional fourth fighter, forming the four-finger shape. If forced to split up, 109s can break into pairs, with both leaders receiving separate cover from their wingmen. You have a formation that can attack. It's useful for offensive tactics, but it's also being protected and can defend itself. The Finger Four allows the 109s to dominate the skies over Spain. Now, not only did that make them successful in Spain, but it would come as a great surprise when World War II broke out and the Luftwaffe was using the well-developed Finger Four against more traditional Vic formations of other countries. September 1939. After years of territorial disputes, Hitler invades neighboring Poland. The German Blitzkrieg is swift and decisive. The BF-109 is there literally every step of the way, making sure that the Poles are never really able to get their footing under them. Two days later, France and the United Kingdom rise up to defend their Polish allies. But there's little they can do to stop the rapid Nazi advance. So from the Polish invasion, Germany swept across Europe. Poland, Denmark, Belgium, Norway fell one after the other and one constant through all of this was the BF-109 sweeping the skies of enemy aircraft. Using the Finger Four formation and other tactics that they had developed in Spain, they took these foreign air forces by surprise. Leading the charge is the 109's newest variant, the 109E model. Equipped with a new fuel-injected engine, and cannons in both wings. 
the E-model outflies and outfires every enemy aircraft in its path. It was faster, more capable, and that was a key to German victory. German forces soon sweep through France, paving the way for total control of the continent. All that stands in its way is Britain. July 16, 1940. Hitler puts forth plans for Operation Sea Lion, a proposed invasion of the British coast. The first step in the plan, squash the British Air Force. For this, Germany will rely heavily on the 109. The primary role of the 109 would be to lure British fighters into the air, where they could then be destroyed in aerial combat. This is a means of gaining air superiority. But the Luftwaffe faced their largest obstacle yet, the 21-mile-wide English Channel. The Battle of Britain was the first time that the 109 had to deal with an expanse of water. The E model had proven itself as a superb fighter, but it still had a range of only 410 miles. That's round trip. And that amounted in practice to only about 15 minutes over London. The 109s will be running against the clock with every flight. If caught over the channel for too long, pilots could find themselves falling to a watery grave. July 24th, 1940. Fighter wing JG-26 preps for its first mission over England. Commanding the unit is Major Adolf Galland. Major Adolf Galland had been uh, recently promoted to take over the third Gruppe of Jagdgeschwader 26. And he brought with him the experience of a man who had fought in the Spanish Civil War and was proving himself both a crack pilot and a good leader. One by one, Galan's 40 ME-109Es fire up their engines and take off from France. They'll be escorting 18 German bombers directly to London's doorstep. Their primary mission was to clear the sky in the area of the Thames estuary so that two squadrons of bombers could attack convoys of British colliers and supply ships. As the 109s approach the English coast, 12 RAF fighters come into view. Spitfires, the RAF's newest and fastest warbird. The British were coming in in flights of six in a tight V formation. Galland and his wingmen in the four-finger formation were making their turns to try to get around, try to get above, and hopefully catch them by surprise while they were in that tight V. With eyes now on their prey, the 109s position themselves above the unsuspecting Spitfires. Galan gives the signal, and the fighters dive. Galan quickly locks onto a Spitfire and unloads his wing-mounted cannons. The Spitfire spirals down vertically, plummeting to the water below. With one Spitfire down, Galan turns his attention to the rest of his squadron. But what he sees above him is chaos. In spite of the more flexible uh, formations the Germans were using, they found that the British were 
a lot more skilled and certainly more motivated than they expected. And this is when they got their first taste of uh, all-out battle with the RAF. The heavily outnumbered Spitfires outmaneuver the German pilots at every turn, causing the 109s to burn precious fuel with each pass. An ME 109E could probably engage for about as much as a half an hour. Add to that the kind of extra fuel that you're burning during a aerial engagement, and you're using up that precious fuel and time to get back across the channel. One after the other, the 109's low fuel lights begin to glow. You see that low fuel light going, then there's just nothing for it at that point but to turn in the direction of France and pray. Galland and his squadron are out of fuel and out of time. With no other choice, Galland pulls into a sharp dive and retreats, now praying that his fuel-starved 109 can make it back to France. With his engine coughing and propeller slowing, Galland just barely makes it to the runway. As far as Galland was concerned, that was not good enough. As men approached the mission of July 24th with uh, a case of victory disease, things had been going their way too well for too long. He would try to correct that in the future. But as the Battle of Britain wears on, the Messerschmitt's short range begins to become its Achilles heel. It is now the British who have the initiative to strike wherever they want against the German formations. And it's a tremendous disadvantage to have to overcome when you've got only about 15 minutes worth of fight in you. After only two months, Hitler's planned invasion of England is postponed indefinitely. And by October 1940, the Battle of Britain is over. Suffering his first major defeat, Hitler instead looks to the east. Hitler's primary ambition was to always invade the Soviet Union. That was his entire premise for going to war in the first place, subdue the west, consolidate his forces, and then push to the east. June 22nd, 1941, Hitler initiates Operation Barbarossa the invasion of the Soviet Union. Two million German troops flew across the border and began just smashing their way through Stalin's weak defenses. They gained about 300 miles in the first 10 days. On the front lines is yet another 109 upgrade, the 109F model. You had a more powerful engine, and you had a larger wing surface, which gave you better airflow and gave you more control in tight, twisting dogfights. After Germany's losses over Britain, the souped-up 109Fs are determined to prove themselves against the Soviets. The Luftwaffe absolutely wrecked the Soviet Air Force. German fighter pilots scored victories literally in the hundreds. The top three highest scoring German fighter pilots respectively shot down 352, 301, and 275 aircraft, and nearly all of these were over the Soviet Union. These numbers boggle the mind. And they're not just big by German standards. They are the leading aces, not only in World War II, but in the history of aerial combat. And in July of 1943, 109 pilots are able to put their fighters through the ultimate test, going head to head with a tank.
July 5th, 1943. Fighter wing JG-52 preps for the opening day of the Battle of Kursk. The Battle of Kursk was an apocalyptic battle with the largest tank combat in the history of humankind. With thousands of tanks below, it will be up to the 109s to take down Soviet bombers headed for the front lines. Their job is specifically nothing more than clear the skies ahead of the armored column, protect the infantry, and basically be the shield ahead of the ground force. Around 9 a.m., First Lieutenant Walter Krupinski and his wingman, Sergeant Heinz Ewald, join the 109s departing towards the front lines. They were flying from airfields that were less than 10 to 15 minutes flying time from the combat front. Krupinski and Ewald cross over enemy lines and begin to scan the sky for incoming enemy aircraft. Within minutes, Krupinski spots a formation of Russian bombers below, headed straight for German lines. Krupinski realizes that he is in the perfect position because he's above them, behind them. All he has to do is wing over with an attack from the rear, shooting down at a 45 to blow into the fuselage or shoot the engines out. Krupinski and Ewald cut through the bomber formation, hitting two bombers apiece. But as the two pull out of their dive, Krupinski notices a line of Soviet tanks barreling towards German troops. The smoke clears, and that's when Krupinski sees 10 to 12 tanks on line rolling right towards a German unit. And the Germans couldn't see the Russians. If the Soviet tanks aren't stopped, the German ground troops will be sitting ducks. With only seconds to act, Krupinski dives on the tanks. Every German pilot and every German soldier knew the weakest part of a vehicle is the rear. So they already know the rear end of a tank is the best place to attack. What they didn't think was that a fighter could take out a tank. But Krupinski thought, well, why not? Krupinski pulls up only feet above the ground. But when he does this, he's so low, all the, all the enemy soldiers have to, they drop their weapons and hit the ground because his propeller is just like four feet off the deck. He lines up and unloads his 20 millimeter cannon on the nearest tank. The tank erupts into flames. And Krupinski peels out. And the element of surprise is over and now, now they're taking rifle and pistol fire. Everything that has a bullet is being fired at them. But the Soviet tanks continue forward. Kropinski goes back around, lines up on the rear of the next T-34 that he can, uses the last of his ammunition. That one burns. Now fully aware of the advancing Soviet troops, the German ground forces take cover and set up a line of defense. So that saved a lot of German lives from what would have been a massacre, because they had no idea that the danger was so close. And uh, from that point forward, the 109 role ironically changed from being air superiority and ground support to being, well, if you see a tank, shoot it. It works. And Kropinski did that quite well and had a total of 12 tank kills or at least tank attacks uh, with good results during the battle. But as the war on the Eastern Front grinds on, the sheer number of Soviet troops begins to wear down German forces. The Soviets could replace the losses, the Germans couldn't. The Germans destroyed more aircraft, they destroyed more tanks, they killed more soldiers but Germany could not replace those losses. Stalin could. As Luftwaffe supplies continue to dwindle, 
the number of new advanced Soviet aircraft only grows. Despite its initial success, the Battle of Kursk is Germany's last major offensive on the Eastern Front. Kursk kind of ends with a whimper, kind of withers away, because by the second week of July, American and British forces are already in southern Sicily, because if Sicily falls, Italy's next. So Hitler pulls his forces from the Kursk salient to bolster the Western Front against the southern flank invasion. Now pressured from all sides of Europe, Hitler is forced to send his fighter planes to the one battlefront he never expected, Germany. August, 1943. Faced with round-the-clock bombing raids over Germany, the Luftwaffe brings in its newest upgrade of the now seven-year-old 109, the g -Mark. To combat increased attacks at night, officials propose a unique use for the new model, a night fighter unit known as the Wildesau. We had no radar equipment at all. We were just uh, guided by radar from the ground. And we're flying on sight with the help of many searchlights. In 1944, Lieutenant Jörg Chipianka flew as a BF-109 night fighter over Germany. This was a very special night for the unit against the high-flying mosquitoes attacking Berlin, and Berlin was actually the target we had to protect. With speeds over 400 miles per hour, the British mosquitoes are not only fast, but deadly. The mosquitoes were quite light. And they were able to carry a big, big bomb load, 4,000 pound single bombs. And they came to the target and dropped one bomb and they had disappear again. So this was the tactic and the mosquito was very capable of it. Each night, the Wildesau 109s take off from Berlin. But the high flying mosquitoes are too hard to swat sometimes 20 or 30 such lights could find one mosquito in the big sky somewhere. And uh, if you see this lighted spot, you try to get there. But uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Mostly it didn't. It's clear the aging 109s are rapidly becoming outclassed by the new generation of Allied aircraft. As we did not have the best success with the 109s, there was the look for faster aircraft which could catch the mosquitoes everywhere. Germany is against the ropes. If the Luftwaffe can't find a replacement for the 109 soon, defeat is almost certain. But Nazi leaders believe they have an ace in the hole, a brand new technology never before seen on the battlefield. In 1944, Nazi Germany's Messerschmitt 109 fighter force is being outflown by a new generation of Allied aircraft. To counter, the Luftwaffe introduce a new secret weapon of their own, the Messerschmitt 262, the world's first operational jet aircraft. Perhaps the final nail in the coffin of the 109 as the leading German fighter plane in the sky was the appearance of an even faster, even sleeker, even more modern one. And it's the ME Messerschmitt 262. With speeds up to 540 miles per hour, the Luftwaffe hopes the new jet will be just what the night fighters need to take down the RAF's mosquito bombers once and for all. March, 1945. Lieutenant Jörg Chipianka loads into his new ME-262 and takes off. And in the distance, you could already see Berlin, which is always illuminated by the, the beacons, by the fires, by the searchlights. 
As Chipianka approaches Berlin, he waits for a call to come in from the ground radar station. Then, suddenly, a shape cuts through the darkness directly in front of him. It's an RAF mosquito bomber, fresh off a bombing run. We're flying by chance in exactly the same height, and the mosquito crossed my way in about maybe five or 10 meters in front of me. Had we split seconds different, we would have collided. Chipianka pulls his aircraft into the darkness after the bomber. The 262 speed does not disappoint. The speed of the Messerschmitt 262 was at least 200 to 300 kilometers faster than the Mosquito was. So this is a different kind of flying. I followed this aircraft and followed him quite some time. It was dark night, there's no illumination, of course. Shibianka slides behind the Mosquito, lines up his cannon, and fires. And only three rounds come, came out, and the Mosquito was down. With his first Mosquito victory now under his belt, Chipianka turns and heads back to base. In the following weeks, the ME-262s proved to be a worthy successor of the BF-109s. But as the months pass, it's clear that even the new jets aren't enough to keep Germany in the fight. German city life is now a constant stream of bombers. Thousand plane raids over every single city you can imagine. In the end, it's, it's a hopeless mission. With allies crossing the Rhine and Russian forces inside Berlin, Nazi Germany agrees to an unconditional surrender on May 7, 1945. But even after the Nazi war machine is dead, the BF-109 lives on in the afterlife, from Israel to Spain. Leftover 109s continue to fight and fly in other air forces around the world. Here's an aircraft that was roughly 1934 technology, and you would still see them in the air in the mid-1950s and perhaps even beyond that. Fast versatile and deadly. Throughout its service, the Messerschmitt BF-109's many variations provided an option for every kind of fight. The 109 was capable of almost infinite variation, and there's A's and B's and C's and D's, I think, all the way out to K's. So it's turned into a kind of hybrid. A revolutionary aircraft that was both loved and hated. In the end, the BF-109's legacy is twofold. One, it's this story of this incredibly advanced fighter by brilliant minds. But at the same time, its legacy is also an icon of an awful and evil regime. One thing is certain, the Messerschmitt BF-109 will go down as one of World War II's most influential fighters.